Um, so, you know, we are going to focus um, on, on disclosure issues. Um, we do this in the environment of a, of a gen and I'm, as a rule, I'm not going to read the slides on the assumption that you can all read the slides when they're up there. I'm just going to talk around them. So, you know, we, we do operate in an environment where there are sort of generalized disclosure principles which apply all the time, um, which have an application in the M&A space. And, and then we also have specific um, disclosure obligations that apply more or less only in, in the M&A space. Um, and and it, it is true, at least as far as I'm concerned, that there is no general federal disclosure obligation to disclose material developments, right? I mean, you know, we've all heard the example that if you strike oil under your headquarters, you don't have to immediately run out and issue a press release saying you just struck oil under the headquarters. Now, there are a number of other circumstances while, why you might otherwise have a duty to speak. Um, and, and if you do have a duty to speak that's sort of separate and apart from the fact that, gee, something important just happened, you do have an obligation to speak correctly and accurately. And so we pay very close attention to those things which would obligate you to speak to make sure that when those times arise that you're, you're doing so correctly. So, you know, what do we think about in terms of creating a duty to speak? Well, it's certainly under the, the thir under the federal securities laws, you have the 33 Act and you have a registration statement or prospectus, clear obligation to speak. Um, under the 34 Act, there are a number of periodic filings, 10Ks, 10Qs, 8K, uh, I'm sorry, 8Ks, that, that create a duty to speak about specific matters. And then if you're going to speak about one of those matters and it touches upon an M&A transaction, then obviously you have to deal with the disclosure there. Um, there are more specific 34 Act requirements like a proxy statement, and if you're going to ask your shareholders to vote on something that touches upon an M&A um, transaction, then obviously there are extensive disclosure requirements under those circumstances. But then we also have to look outside the federal securities law for sources of the obligation to speak, uh, obviously stock exchange rules, uh, and quite, quite opposite of the federal securities laws, the stock exchange rules tend to create a duty to disclose material corporate developments. Um, enforcement mechanisms are very different. Um, basically, the sole remedy the stock exchange has is to threaten to delist you. It's not something they want to do very often. But, but certainly, there's a tension, there's a tension there. Um, we all have you know, long tried to honor a no comment policy in whenever there's a rumor or something in the market, which may be perfectly fine under appropriate circumstances for the SEC, but if the exchanges call and ask for a comment, uh, and they're calling on a confidential basis, they're not necessarily saying put out a press release, they're saying tell us what's going on, they won't accept a no comment answer. And so there's a separate l line that develops um, under those circumstances. Um, now, um, we also um, have to pay attention um, and increasingly close attention to Delaware law. Um, now, this is a slide that's kind of missing in this um, presentation, but, but um, Delaware has adopted kind of a 10B5 type standard for disclosure. Um, they haven't adopted a, a duty to speak, per se, um, but they have clearly signed on to the proposition that when you are speaking, most importantly, when you're out there talking to your shareholders, to solicit a vote on a matter that's being brought before shareholders, that you have to speak accurately. And uh, on the one hand, um, it's, it's a relatively simple standard because it is a 10B5 standard. On the other hand, uh, unlike you know, the SEC, which adopts a form that has you know, 20 different items in it and very specific disclosure obligations that you then respond to, there are no forms for Delaware. I mean, it's just general materiality. And since all of your disclosure questions in Delaware tend to be 2020 hindsight, it's the plaintiff's bar, it's, you know, it's, it's litigation related. Um, it's very, very easy to get second guessed on whether or not you were disclosing things. And, and you can see where the Delaware courts have moved in that direction in a sense ever since the, uh, the Delaware General Corporation Law was amended to provide under the, the Section 102B7 uh, exculpatory provision that says you can eliminate mo the liability for monetary damages for breaches of the duty of care. Um, and that's been a tremendous benefit um, to corporate directors and to corporations generally. 
but just applying the law of unintended consequences, one of the things that's happened as a result of that is that once a deal closes, there is essentially no remedy for a disclosure problem that was created by a duty of care issue rather than a duty of loyalty issue. And therefore, all of that litigation has been front end loaded into preliminary injunction and other similar um, equitable proceedings um, while transactions are pending. And the Delaware Chancery Court is making rulings, you know, admittedly on an ad hoc basis because that's what they do. They, they rule in specific cases as to whether or not disclosure in a specific proxy statement or information statement is adequate. Um, and the effort there is you try and get corrective disclosure in the document before the vote is held, and therefore the remedy doesn't involve money damages. There is a remedy, and, and, and of course there's a settlement for the plaintiff's bar as well. Now, Delaware ha the Delaware judges have focused um, very heavily on things like conflicts of interest, right? They're very, very focused on that. And they're focused on it on an, in sort of in, in interesting ways. So for example, whereas if you go look at Reg MA and, and if, if you're the target company and you have to disclose the opinion of your financial advisor and you're including a lot of information about how much you paid your financial advisor and what they've done for you in the past, a lot of that grew up out of a theory that, that the bankers were being paid success fees and therefore they had an inherent conflict of interest to say the transaction was fair, right, because they'd make a lot of money on the success fee. The Delaware courts have, have, have taken kind of an, an opposite approach to that in the sense they're more interested in making sure that there's disclosure about the target banker's relationship to the acquirer. So if you've got a situation where, you know, you've got a, the, the target's banker is giving a fairness opinion, but two years ago it represented the acquirer in a public offering and it made a lot of money in underwriting fees, then the Delaware courts want to see that disclosed. And there's a recent decision um, just to, within the last couple of weeks where they said you had to disclose four years' worth of payments to the other side's banker. Um, there was also a decision earlier this year where the, the, the substance of the complaint was that although there was no relationship between the other side's banker, right, there was an individual who had switched firms and was now on the other side's banker that had a close personal relationship with the target. And, and that became an issue that the Delaware courts looked at very, very carefully in terms of whether or not some sort of corrective disclosure was required. So um, while we all have historically tended to think of these disclosure issues in the context of SEC 10b-5, um, I think in the context of M&A involving Delaware companies, um, we have to be increasingly cautious about the, the impact of the, the Delaware Chancery Court. Um, so coming down more to specifics, right, in, in the M&A setting, right, we, we all do as a rule, try and manage the process so that um, in the ideal world there is no disclosure about a an M&A transaction until a definitive agreement is signed, right? Um, there's a host of reasons for that. Um, if, you're on the, if you're on the buy side, you don't want rumors to cause a run-up in the stock price so that all of a sudden rather than paying a healthy premium, you're paying a discount to market. Um, if you don't want to, uh, you don't want leaks to occur so that somebody else who doesn't know that the company is considering, the target company is considering a sale, has the opportunity to come in and, um, and, and lob in an offer. Um, ten, ten, ten years ago, I represented um, General Electric when it tried to acquire Honeywell, and I will say that we didn't do the antitrust work on that for those of you who are old enough to remember that transaction. But that was a situation where um, rumors arose um, during the course of the negotiations between Honeywell and United Technologies that a transaction was pending. Um, and GE, Jack Welch hand wrote out a, uh, an offer on a blank fax cover sheet and faxed it into the CEO of Honeywell while their board was in session, right? And having received that offer, the, bo the Honeywell board concluded that it couldn't approve the United Technologies transaction that they had been working on for months and were, would otherwise have approved at that meeting and announced. And so GE, instead of competing with a, you know, a billion plus breakup fee, was able to compete before any breakup fee commitment had been put in place. So leaks are a bad thing for 
most participants in, a, in, a, in an M&A transaction, but especially for the, for the buyer. Now, on the target side, you know, the, the answer is not quite so clear because sometimes a target may conclude that it wants to, to, uh, to orchestrate a leak um, if for no other reason than to try and help satisfy its Revlon obligations, right? If you're about to sign up a deal and there's been no, no pre-signing market check or there's been no full auction, then you can imagine circumstances where um, a company might decide um, that, well, you know, maybe a little bit of a leak is not necessarily a, a bad thing. Um, now, um, we, we talk about letters of intent. Obviously, letters of intent are very common in the private deal space. They have become extraordinarily rare in the public arena um, for just the reasons I've mentioned. Um, people do want confidentiality agreements. They do want standstills. If you're a buyer and you can get an exclusivity agreement for some short period of time, you obviously want to get those and, and have them be binding. Um, but I think the practicing bar has concluded that, that you can make those things binding without having them trigger an independent disclosure obligation because if you apply the standard basic V. Levinson test, at that point in time, things are not so certain to result in a material transaction that you conclude you have to say something. 